Hello, everybody. We are back for another Bread and Wine. I'm here with my lovely wife, Nicole, and we are doing the show every Friday, everybody. You know, this is a conversation between a husband and a wife about money, relationships, kids, parenting, everything all under the sun. And uh, this week, we've got a special episode. We are going to be included. Uh, we are going we're to on include, a double date. We're on a double date. Exactly. We're, <laughs> we're on a double wine date, and we are inviting another couple into this universe, and it's... Uh, Somebody that I spent some good time with, and Nicole is spending a little bit more time with the um, the, the, the spouse today. So uh, without further ado, we're going to be introducing Scott and Taylor Rickens. These are the stars and the creators of the documentary film, Playing With Fire. This came out a couple years ago, and it... Uh, Swept the nation. It swept. It swept all the money nerds of the nation. Absolutely, I really enjoyed the movie. Uh, it got uh, uh, recognized by U.S. News as one of the top ten best finance movies of the decade. So Woo-hoo! it was fantastic, wow. and I'm really excited to have them on the show to uh, talk fire because we've talked about fire on this show before. Both our our pros and our cons, our loves, our hates of everything like that, and uh, maybe find out where they are today with their fire journey. So welcome to the show, Scott and Taylor. Hi guys. Can you see, can you hear us, guys? <laughs> so seamless. That was amazing. Well done. What an intro. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Can you hear us? yeah, we can hear you well. Uh-oh. Go for it. How are you? Okay. I think there's a Good. delay. Yeah. Thank you for that introduction. That was very complimentary and nice. Appreciate it. Uh oh. I think there is maybe a smidge of a delay. It's okay. We're gonna work on it and we'll do our best. But we're glad you guys are here. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. And while we're at it, why don't we raise our glasses of wine and uh, and cheers to uh, to an episode together? Thank you guys so much for being here. This is gonna be a lot of fun. So why don't we start off with uh, maybe if you guys? Yes, that's exactly how we have to do it. <laughs> uh, maybe you guys could tell us. A little bit about the film and why you created it in the first place, just to give people some context, just so because they might not know a little bit about the film. So tell us, give us a little background. Sure. So um, before we swept the money nerd nation uh, <laughs> with our film, uh, we uh, we were living in a high cost of living area. We were riding the brink of paycheck to paycheck lifestyle. We were going out to dinner constantly. We were wondering why there wasn't more. And then all of a sudden we were adding an additional human to our brood. And all of that kind of coalesced into uh, me in particular feeling very stressed out. Taylor was not stressed out. If I'm, I don't mean to speak for you, but yeah, you were, I only, you were fine. I only got shingles. So yeah, I wasn't that stressed. <laughs> that was afterwards. <laughs> Mediocrely stressed. I think that was after. Okay, yeah. Yeah. No, no I but you liked scary. living there and yeah. you weren't really too concerned about all those things. Yes. I was. <laughs> and my, uh, you know, my solution in my head was let's go make more money. And so I started stressing myself out looking for ways to do so, whether it was FBA fulfillment by Amazon businesses or, you know, those were all the rage or, Whatever it was, and I was I was searching for podcasts because I had to walk our brand new baby to get her to stay sleeping. She had to be like in the Bjorn and walking. We found that to work really well. So I would just go for like hour long, two hour long, three hour long walks. And uh, I'd listen to podcasts. And I was trying to find that new side hustle, that new way to increase our income. And I came across a Tim Ferriss podcast with Mr. Money Mustache. And he started talking about the inverse of this idea where actually uh, you decrease the amount of money you need to be happy, and then you have less onus to earn, and then you have more time with your friends and family. And like all of that was so simple and now so obvious, but at the time, so completely novel to me. And I was completely hooked. So I went down that rabbit hole. He took me into other rabbit holes. Next thing you know, I have this wide breadth of an introduction to what I considered the fire movement at at that time and was so fascinated by these people, um, wanted to, I was so excited about the potential that this was gonna give our lives. I wanted to meet them and I happened to be in video production. So I thought, why not combine all these things and make a documentary about this that will give me the access to meet them. And it will also hold us accountable if I can actually pull this off. Cause at the time I wasn't wasn't necessarily sure that I could get Taylor along board with me. And so that's ultimately what the documentary becomes is watching us go through that journey and finding 
uh, finding ways to work together to ultimately embark on a fire journey to improve our future and meet everybody that we were so inspired by along the way. I loved the film and I'm not a money nerd. So, I mean, I think that says a lot. Like Andy's the money nerd and then he just pulled me in and I'm like, all right, this is actually really, I was like doing folding laundry and I actually had to stop folding laundry because I'm like, I'm actually enjoying this. (laughs) And a lot of that's because of Taylor, because I see a lot of myself in Taylor and then also you're just adorable and and you give it like so much color. Um, And the juxtaposition between the two of you, I think makes for such a great story about the fire journey, because a lot, I I have to think that a lot of people would, you know, kind of have when you're, when you're in a relationship and you're sharing your money, not everyone's going to like be on board with, with wanting to retire early. So I loved seeing the conflict. So, but at the end of the film, I mean, I thought it was a great film. Don't get me wrong, but it was such a short like amount of time in this really, really long journey. It's kind of like somebody running a marathon, but you, you know, the whole movie took place between mile three and four. (laughs) And I'm kind of like, all right, well, where's the end of the, like, when did you cross the finish line? Like, I want to see the rest. So I'm super excited that we get to talk to you today and kind of get a little bit of insight in that part. Well, with that, why don't don't we ask? I mean, you guys, you went through the situation. Uh, We went through the movie. I mean, it's now been two years at the end of the movie, this was a big decision. Tell, tell us what happened. at. Well, I guess I'm not going to tell what happened at the end of the movie. That's kind of, <laughs> that kind of ruins everything. Let's talk about where you guys are today. So you made some transitions in your life. You adopted a little bit of the fire lifestyle. What has changed since two years ago? It's actually been a little more than that. It's it's almost been three and a half years. Oh, wow. We were really done. With the, fi- with the filming, yeah, with she's the filming, right. Yeah all the edits and then the release and everything. So yeah. yeah, it was a while ago. So for example, in the movie, our daughter is 18 months old when we leave Coronado. Spoiler alert. That's at the very beginning. It's okay. Um, we leave there and she's 18 months old and she is going to be six in October. So oh my God. Wow. Set into perspective how long <laughs> that process was. And I know that in the movie, you know, it feels like a very little amount of time, but it was like 14 months almost of filming and from start to finish. So it was a long period of our life in, in, in that aspect, Mm -hmm. but it did go by so fast. And we, we have had such an amazing journey, I think, since that ended. Um, And and you're right, Nicole, like it was definitely mile three and four of the marathon (laughs) to go through that one little part. But, but at the same time, I think at least we we assumed at the time that that would be like probably the most amount of drama yes it was was in the, was in the beginning of the race <laughs> when you've got all the racers lined up and you're trying yep. to get in front of the pack and find your spot yeah um, you're elbowing other can, people yeah <laughs> to you're... just bring this metaphor all the way through um <laughs> and so uh yeah like i think um now we have quite a few updates but you know i i, I do want to bring up real quick in case i forget uh, one of the criticisms of the movie um, that I think I've seen the most, I want to say it's the most consistent criticism, is um, that you go through the movie and Taylor is the reluctant, she's like the reluctant protagonist. Like, you know, she's kind of like the reluctant Han Solo or something in the film. <laughs> and the good news is I didn't have to act at all for that. I was very <laughs> reluctant. I was extremely yeah. <laughs> reluctant. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't want to leave. I There's didn't almost wanna... no acting in the film itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No acting. No. No. The only, I will give you a, uh, an exclusive, Andy and <laughs> Nicole. The one piece that was acted was our happiness list scene because we had done that previous to actually hitting record for the first time. And we felt like it was such a wonderful and important um, piece of our process to really get started that we wanted to include that in the film so that's the only time we technically acted but, but hilariously but it, enough as soon as the camera went what are you gonna say i was just gonna say it wasn't even acted because yeah. we didn't like we didn't show each other what we were gonna say and so as we were saying it it was like a live reaction of what that really was yeah okay. they were similar lists yeah. to what our first list was but there were a few changes so kind of like mixed it up so it was it was like it was live it was done live but we kind of knew it was like the only produced scene in the entire yeah. movie but anyway the criticism that was so uh, prevalent was that they felt like Taylor was super reluctant and then all of a sudden it was sort of abrupt that she was suddenly on board and everything mm-hmm. was fine. And um, 
And I actually agree with that criticism. Um, and I remember when we were in the editing, uh, at the, at the very late stages of editing, that was pretty obvious to us too. Um, the team consensus was that like the, there's a scene prior to when she kind of comes around where we're, we're learning more and more and seeing, um, sort of outcomes through the camp mustache experience where there's people that are already retired and living their best life and everything. And Taylor's kind of enjoying learning from them. And they felt like that was enough of a bridge. And there was a lot of sort of back and forth on whether that was enough. And it ultimately came down to, we lost, we, like we, we ran out of time. We just didn't have any more time to continue to massage this thing. We'd gone so long already. And so, um, I, I just want, you know, in case there's people out there listening that agree with that criticism, I just want to address that publicly <laughs> probably for the first time and say, I completely agree with you. Um, and however, I, and I can assure you it was a very long, long journey for me and <laughs> all of the things you didn't see behind the scenes were, you know, me crying in rooms with yeah. a closed door and being like, I don't want this life. This is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There, yeah. there was a lot of that, but yeah. you know, to have a film crew follow you for that long is, it's a lot. And it is, it was such an amazing journey to be able to do it on camera. Cause now we, I always say best home video we ever made, you know? <laughs> Just like, well, so there's a lot of people that, that, uh, that well, listen to the show or listen to this podcast and they have those conversations with their spouse where it's like, Hey, I'm not digging what I'm doing right now. What can we do to make a little bit of a change so that we can, I guess, kind of both live our best lives today, not wait until we're 60 or plus to do this. I guess, Scott, how did you initially have some of those conversations? One, how did you initially have those conversations for her to, to be interested in fire? And then two, how to record it publicly for everybody to see? How did those conversations yeah. go? So, the, yeah, I'll, I'll back up. I'll, I'll answer that those questions inversely. The... Uh, <laughs> The recording part was you lied to me. Yeah, total, <laughs> total hooking. Yes, it really was. It was like we like backed into that. So the original. No, let me tell it. Oh, sure. He sure. said. Yeah. He said. Um, hey, oh my gosh, this big thing. You know, and you could tell the first part about how you got me to talk about the finance part. Once he got me onto that, he was like, Oh my gosh, there's no documentary. Of course, I have to make a documentary. I'm a filmmaker. I'm like, Of course, do your thing. Like, make your movie. Like, that's great. I've been a part of a lot of that with him for, you know, 10 years at that point. Like, of course, go do what you do. Then we went on our journey and we met our director and he was like, well, you're the story. So we're going to film you and have you do this process. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Nobody <laughs> said that. That was not part of the plan. Yeah. And I think if it wouldn't, if it wouldn't have come from someone else, yeah. oh, I would have happened. never said yes. <laughs> I... I would have never said yes to this. I was adamantly against pretty much all of it. Yeah. But our director, Travis, Travis Shakespeare, is literally, I talked to him yesterday, one of our, our just most closest, wonderful friends, and who we met on this journey, and truly was just a really big mentor to us and like really convinced me, like, Taylor, put, this, put your story out there to help others, and it will make a difference. And I think that was the selling point for me to say, fine, you can come into my house. You know, like that was... That was a lot. Yeah, wow. and I, I, I was, I was not going to take credit for getting her on camera because it really was. <laughs> we just backed into it, and the original idea was I would be more of like, an a, like a David Attenborough narrator almost, right? Like I would be going and and meeting these people and expressing my my findings and maybe some of my opinions about it. Um, but not really showing our journey so much, just showing others' journeys. And that was sort of the documentary that I had in mind. Um, and then uh, the acceleration point was actually when Taylor gave me that support, I went full bore. And <laughs> one of the first things I did was I reached out to the Choose Fi podcast, Jonathan and Brad, who I was you know, an adamant listener at that point. I think they maybe had 20 episodes at that point. And... Um, and I just reached out to them and I, they actually still have the voicemail. And we used to play that at the screenings, which was so fun to listen to that, like, you know, green, wide eyed idiot. A lot of vigor. Calling you in. had a lot of vigor. I had, yeah, like, a lot of, I'm just so uh, excited about vinegar. this movement. And yeah. I just want to, I'm going to make this documentary. Hey guys, you know, filmmaker from San Diego. I tried to like spice it up quite a bit and I'm really looking to do a documentary on this movement. I think you guys would be amazing to feature, which I still believe they are and were. And, uh, you know, and I would love to have you a part of it. And I figured they would probably be excited about that because they're pretty new with the podcast game. They want, they've got somebody asking to 
film them in a documentary. Of course, they want the exposure. I thought it was all going to work out great, which it did. But I didn't expect them to invite me on like a week later. And this is my first podcast ever, ever. Like I, I have, I, yeah. So I was nervous and I didn't know what was going to happen. And they basically introduced me as the guy that was making the fire documentary, which I, I hadn't set up a website. I hadn't really <laughs> planned this out too much yet. I was still kind of thinking about it. And so when I called them, and we, weren't, so, we weren't really planning on moving yet. Like, yeah, so they kind of really been set in stone. It yeah. was like wow. all very new. Yeah, they turned the tables on me. Here yeah. I am thinking that I was going to get them excited, and they ended up getting me excited and getting it going. And so that kind of started the journey. But that's the reason I bring that up is Travis heard that episode and was like, "Oh no, this guy's making my documentary." He had gone to Chautauqua a year prior, which is this fire event in Ecuador at the time and had met a lot of these guys that are, ended up being in the film and was, was like also from video production. He's an executive producer of the show Life Below Zero on Discovery. He worked for many years on um, uh, what's the uh, Deadliest Catch. Uh, he's done a lot of the Alaska stuff. And so he was already in production as well on even a higher level than, than I was. I was more like commercials, um, agency, marketing agency world. And so he was walking around getting all the, um, getting all the, you know, our, our eventual cast members signed on to his documentary and they were stoked about it. I mean, here's a guy with all this credential and then he hears me come on and just, I'm saying this stuff and he's like, Oh no, he's doing my documentary. Oh no. <laughs> and so he ended up, he like slept on it, meditated on it and then ended up reaching out to me and saying, how can I help? If Which you was, can't beat you know, him, join him. Right. <laughs> right. It's such a Travis move. He's just such a stand up human yeah, in general. That explains a lot about yeah. him. Yeah. And so we happened to be in Seattle at the time uh, visiting Taylor's parents, and he happened to be flying through Seattle to go up to Alaska for some other show he was doing, shoot he was doing, and he asked if we could meet up. And so I literally like met him 10 minutes from the airport, and we had a dinner together for like an hour, and it went really well. And he basically was like, I'd be interested in being a part of this project if you'd have me. And I was, I just, I'll never forget like driving home, calling Tay and being like, I can't believe this, but we have this unbelievably tenured director who wants to direct this film this is going to change everything and then we found out we were in it so it was <laughs> it's kind of like the so. universe made the movie not you guys right? it's like everything yes. pushed you yes. into it and then they were like now you're gonna have to do the fire movement because yeah <laughs> that's how we feel you're making a movie about yes. it <laughs> i want to and i exactly. also want to remind everyone it was it was the idea of the movie was playing with fire like we're just trying it out yeah. we're not fire experts and yeah. i feel like we kind of got backed into that really early on like everyone was like oh you know everything about this and we we're like no 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 we're just learning just like you you know and yeah. so creating that that relationship with money for us was just as new as it was for everybody else yeah um, and i had a lot of I, I don't i know you were a little more sheltered from this and that was by design but I, I was obviously, you know, in this, this was my day job. It wasn't Taylor's. And so I tried to do my best not to bring her in too much, even though she was definitely like the star of the movie, in my opinion as well. Oh, thanks, um, <laughs> but like the, the, the big thing was I had never done any of this media stuff. And, and you guys know this now well too, I'm sure it, it was very much like the media was creating an identity for me instead of me understanding what this new identity was. And so that was kind of, a, that was like the bit of the hard knocks part of it where all of a sudden I'm being asked questions that are so framed in a way that I wasn't, I wasn't apt enough to understand how to reconfigure the question to the answer that I needed to answer. Instead, I became, yeah, like a spokesperson for the fire movement, which also sort of felt right because I needed to promote the film, you know, to do that diligence. But it got real weird. I mean, Andy, you remember we went on a walk run, whatever that was with pull-ups and the rest of a, it at FinCon, I maybe had an hour of sleep that night. And I was just, I was just gushing to you like a, like, I don't know, like a teenager. Like I couldn't keep my emotions together and you were so awesome. And then I was like, okay, Andy's my guy for life. Aww. You're a good man. Awesome. <laughs> so I see your beautiful house, my mind. <laughs> your beautiful house in the background. Is that the, the same um, home that you guys bought at the end of the movie? No, it's not. So, oh. um, updates. Yes, we, um, we absolutely, we just feel so fortunate in so many ways, but the house we bought is five doors down this way. Okay. Um, and it was on the road, which in the movie we talk about, we made a huge sacrifice buying on the road and kind of living in a smaller space and it was, you know, whatever. Well, that next year and a half, we had saved so much more money, which honestly, 
if you rewound three years prior to that, we would have never even dreamed that we had enough money to think about another purchase. And we were able to do that in a year and a half after that first purchase. And we bought the house five doors up because it has a short-term rental on it. Mm. So now when we leave, we can rent our place out and create a cash flow that way, which I wasn't really sure how I'd feel about people being in my house when I wasn't here. But honestly, I don't know if it's just the neighborhood or what it is, but we've had just the most lovely renters and it's been just a really great thing for us because we travel so much and we're gone so much. So And remind people where you are in the country. We're in Bend, Oregon. Beautiful. So Mm -hmm. that that was also a really big change for us. Um, After the movie, obviously, we settled down and we like found a spot to live and, um, you know, just started over, which was really scary for me with a new kid. And it's been the best thing we ever did. I feel like just putting ourselves out there and meeting new people. And we've convinced our parents to come as well, which they when we first came here, they were like, we're never moving to Bend. We're (laughs) all in San Diego. No way. We're never leaving, which I said, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. And then after a year and a half or so, we, you know, dangled our five year old at that time or four year old (laughs) over and said, you know, don't you want to see her? It's going to be great. And so now they all have little, um, you know, areas that they're able to come up to, too. So it's been it's been a really, really good change for us. That's positive manipulation, in my opinion. I think that uh, I think that Thank was a you. good Thank a good you. choice. So, so talk to us a little bit about that. You got you guys have saved up a lot of money. Now you it sounds like you're getting into almost like the rental game a little bit. Talk to us about your playing with fire plans. You don't have to call them fire plans, but just call them your playing with fire plans. So, what are they? Yeah, um, you know, we're still dabbling in fire for sure. Like uh, we're playing with fire still, <laughs> absolutely. Um, we. You know, we went full extreme mode in the film, and that was real. That was actually what we were doing. And when we got to Bend, we and had full our- full extreme for people out there, it's 70% of our income we were saving. That to wow. us was Whoa. full extreme. Yeah, it was more than that. We we hit 78% at one point in the film. And wow. that was at our absolute like misery point. Too, yeah, we decided to that number is not for us. <laughs> no, that was that not, not good. That works for other people, not for us. Yeah, but you know, just like a marathon, if you've never run, uh, <laughs> It's really going to come back to oh, that. Absolutely. You guys we're sprinted. You were you were sprinting. Yeah. You sprinted a marathon. And then, and right. then you yeah. Yeah. twisted your ankle. You know? Yeah, that's right. I mean, how would you know how well you're going to do with that marathon if you don't go your hardest for <laughs> how fast you can run it? And I always remind people, you don't have to do what we did to start in the fire movement or like be a part of 100%. any of that. We were the absolute craziest. I mean, we moved, we sold our stuff. Like we were, we were all in to exactly to Scott's point. Of, yeah. You don't have to, to do, ourselves. you don't have to do any of that stuff. That's, that's another criticism I see from time to time. We, you certainly, we weren't trying to give the impression you had to do all these things or that all the things we did were even feasible for people. It was just our journeys, what we did. That's how we always looked at it. Um, and I think that still pertains today where we, you know, first of all, who's making the rules on what the fire movement is or isn't? I would say I am, you are, we all are. It doesn't make any difference to me. At the end of the day, what matters to me is this idea that you have this hooky little acronym that can draw people into learning more about finances and become financially literate. That's, mm-hmm. that's it. That's all it is to me. That said, um, we do enjoy the idea of having our systems in place so that really what we're, what we're fighting against often, very often is simply the, um, the sort of monthly expenditures that maybe we did or didn't mean to make. And that is such an easier place to be making money decisions from together or, or individually than where we were prior, where we were barely making ends meet. And, um, and so every decision made, it counted so much more. And so, you know, it had such a higher penalty rate. And so, you know, people in that position, I would recommend trying to go as hard as you can towards a higher savings rate because you can work backwards, Mm -hmm. right? But if you go only to a certain mark and then you feel like that might be difficult, well, maybe you've never tried to go a little bit further to see if maybe, you know, if you go 60% and then, oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. And then all of a sudden you come back to 40 because that's a little bit happier spot as opposed to, running up to 30% and being like, that's the most I could ever do Mm -hmm. when that may or may not be true, you know? And so I don't know that this is all personal to everyone's personal journey, but I I, I just think that's kind of like when we try to give advice just based off of our own experience, I do say like, do everything you can to go as hard as you can because you can always let off the gas. Yeah. Um, I think for us, once we figured out 
like our housing situation, which we were renting before forever. And we thought that was like, oh, we're going to save money because we're not going to spend as much as a house. But we were drastically wrong, at least in our own setup. Once we got into a house that we could afford, the monthly payment was actually less than we were paying for rent. And it just made so much more sense. So once we figured out housing and our car situation, which I was leasing a car that was far too expensive for what we could afford, and um, our food situation, which for three of us, like shouldn't be that difficult. Um, once we figured out kind of those big three things in the first year, once we really settled, it felt like we could automate a lot of stuff. And then it was like, if you want to go to Starbucks and spend your $5, I'm not going to be mad at you. And if I want to go, you know, buy an extra bottle of wine that's maybe a little over budget, that's okay too. Like there was a lot more flexibility that came after we settled in and had those um, specific you know, points or pillars kind of put into place. Yeah, we didn't even know what that lease car was really doing to our our opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what that was doing at the time. And so, you know, again, the fire journey kind of gave us that, you know, that financial literacy necessary to make better money choices. That's ultimately what it was about. So our, our so that, so you asked about like, how has our fire journey changed? So um, when we first started out, it was all VTSAX all day long, 100%, all day, every day, no questions <laughs> asked. And um, and I'm glad we did that at the time that we did that. But, Tell people uh, what that is, Scott. Oh, sure. <laughs> that's... Uh, that's in, that's index sounds fund dirty. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> right, <laughs> sure, yeah. Yes. He said S A X. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> like where your head's at, Nicole. Yeah, there you go. Um, that was awesome. I've never heard that part. Um, See, Taylor, part we good. have to so, bring we have to bring the funny to these guys. <laughs> I know. I like it. Exactly. I like it. it could uh, be a T-shirt. That could uh, be a T-shirt. Yeah. No, no more T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it's VTSAX, honey. Got it. Get your mind out of the gutter. Um, yeah, so it's uh, so it's index fund investing, which is basically buying a big bucket of stocks that are picked by people who are far smarter than we are and tend to go up at a very uh, conservative yet upward rate. Um, and we look at that as a long-term buy and hold strategy. So we don't care what the market's doing now, tomorrow, or even in 10 years because it's really not going to affect how we live our lives. It's only until we get closer to retirement that we then start to get a little smarter with, you know, where we have our money and how we can pull it out and essentially sip on it um, to, to, you know, maintain our expenses. Uh, but, but hopefully never draw down on the principal. And that's all based on the 4% rule. If people don't know about that, take a look at the 4% rule at this point, you can go, you can Google it. Hopefully uh, one of our YouTube videos will come up talking about it and, uh, uh, it'll explain it, but it's very simple. Um, and so, you know, we kind of predicated most of our in investment strategies off of very simple, max out your retirement accounts first, have them invested in VTSAX, call it a day. And through the years, we've gotten a little bit more um, detailed with that, where we have a certain percentage of our, um, of our stock investments in international exposure. Uh, and we predicated that, I think it's 1585. So 15% are in, in, uh, international funds. And this has been a while since I checked this out, but I got that from the mad scientists, mm -hmm. uh, our friend, Brandon. And, uh, you know, I just read what he was thinking about it and how yes, VTSAX as Jim Collins would say, JL Collins, the simple path to wealth, as he would say, if you're in VTSAX, you're already internationally exposed because these fortune 500 companies have their fingers in, you know, multi fat multi multiple countries around the world they're international already so um that said i you know there was some discussion about how maybe the us was weakening a little bit and so maybe it makes sense to get a little bit more internationally focused and so we just bought the i think it's vtisx or something it's the There's it's the vanguard uh <laughs> index fund yeah and it's uh international so uh, you know yeah. it's a little spicy <laughs> <Dorks>. um, <laughs> Total dorks. You, you can take over the dorkness if you want. If you have a take, take a better question. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so, take so much, question. so much of this. I mean, it's interesting, but it's also like over my head. Like, I want to know, Taylor, are you still driving the the Honda? Like, I, I want to know. Like, let's rapid fire some of these 
burning questions. Yes, I am not. I, wanna, I just want to apologize profusely for being so boring and nerdy, for, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just answering We'll give you questions. a pass. It's just real. You're so loved. I haven't even gotten into real estate it's yet. Really <laughs> please, please, spice it up with the cars. Um, no, I am not, but I did drive it for a solid three years. Um, nice. And we literally bought that car for $5,000. Was oh, the Honda? Thousand? Yeah. Yeah, the Honda CRV. And um, we had a friend that was going to trade in an older car, but still a much nicer car. And we did a little deal with them. So we did a little switcheroo of the car. Ooh. So I'm driving an older car, but I, I think a little bit nicer than the Honda. So um, what is it? So I did my... It's like it's like an old. Um, Why are you being so cagey? I don't know. I feel like <laughs> I get share. so much shade. I get so much shade. Oh Tell me God. what Just it is. Is it? Is it? You a, not, is we it are you're not going to get shade from us. No. It's like a, it's, an, it's a Lexus uh, SUV. Like nice. A, yeah. well, it's a Lexus 450h, and I think it's a 2010, and it has 115,000 miles upon it's it. It's a great it's just car. Just cherry. It's perfect well, well, i love it so much so so we we had a little similar H- honda kind of situation we where did. i was probably look it was probably around the time of the movie maybe not the movie maybe uh, a long time ago i was looking at like hey you know let's just get like a jetta or something uh, we, or we test drove a jetta <laughs> Where I kid you not, this thing was gonna fall apart from wind. Like the the ceiling on it was coming down, and there were like Ooh. cigarette like stains in it. And he's like, like, "It's, it's a quality fine. ride." I'm like, yeah. "Oh my god!" Yeah. So I sound. knew. Huh. So what did we land with? So then, <laughs> so we both ended up with our we with we both had old luxury cars, and they got to the point where they were very old and. So I was like, I'll sell mine and we'll get an SUV because we do have two kids and it's getting pretty tight in these two sedans that we have. Um, And I was like nervous to tell him that I really did want like a luxury car. I'm like, yeah, I I hate I I don't love that. I want that. But there's something in me. It's like I I do want to kind of have a little bit of a nicer thing and it makes me feel good and. It's going to have nice features and um, I don't know. I can't, I can't explain it. I'm not saying that I have to have drive off of the lot with a Lamborghini, like brand new Lamborghini, but you know what I mean? Well, what, I mean what happens I, if- I felt you so hard when you were talking about your, your Honda being <laughs> fine. I was like, I oh, that's like exactly that- how I would feel. I have to say that scene is so cringeworthy for me to watch back. Like I honestly, in every, every film, everywhere we went, I had to leave like pretty much the whole thing. I couldn't watch it. Just it, oh like my to watch gosh. yourself is just yeah. like the worst. I get but that, that, but it was scene, adorable wanted, and it spoke to me. Oh, well, thank you. I wanted to bury my hand head under the sand because it was just a lot for me to watch. But I think the whole thing that we learned in that was, we do like a little bit of a nicer car, but we could do it at such a discounted rate. I mean, we literally, I think we spent nine grand on this car, which was still under the 10,000 mark, which I always had in my head, even though Brandon always said, you need to have under 5,000. I was like, oh, I don't know. But I feel like I compromised. I was yeah. spending so much in comparison to what we ended up buying this for. Like, See, but this was the benefit is that Brandon got stuck in Taylor's head and was guilt shaming her like years later. <laughs> So with whispers in the back of her head that I, I never I said him. I never said anything about, but he was probably more right then than he was when you were hearing the whispers. Because at that time, yes, he was right. We should be aiming for a five or six thousand dollar car based on our net worth and how much cash we had and what kind of car we really needed. He was he was dead on. He was right. But as you know, time progressed and we had more to to play with. There's absolutely no reason why we couldn't spend a little more on that car because we can do the calculations and see how that's going to affect our future in a, such a more responsible way. Um, but I kind of love that Brandon's still sort of in her head a little bit because <laughs> I feel, I feel that's, also, but those are the, we, I call that our money filter. Cause that's yeah. like, that's now what we look at money decisions through. And um, Nicole, I even noticed you when you were explaining, you know, how you felt about wanting electric car, you like, kind of have guilt but you're looking for someone else to agree with you because you don't want to feel that guilt right and i wonder where that comes from because i don't i hope it's not from me because i don't necessarily feel that way either like no. i'm with you like if, if you want that you guys i mean you guys are clearly astute financially if that's what you want like go for it i would say that to anyone as long as they they have a good strong money filter they know what they're doing like 
There's nothing wrong with that. No. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's probably where the the criticisms do come for fire, where it's like you do feel that. Oh, oh no, I can't because it's like no, no, no. As you said, maybe ten minutes ago, define fire however you want to define fire. I love the fire movement, but it's my own special version, the own, our own special version that we've created. Mm -hmm. And I'm you guys too. I mean, it's 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 exactly how you want it to be. And your point, as long as it gets people to pay attention to their money a little bit more, because it's got a catchy name that actually has some controversy around it fantastic fantastic well hey while we're i mean we're getting to a point uh, we got to wrap up in a little bit but i want to ask you guys a question you're looking back now you said four years five years almost but since you guys have been a part of this journey what do you think the pros and cons let's share one pro and one con of your of your decision of not just going through the movie obviously but going through this fire path what would you have done differently and what are you so proud of that you've done Um, I mean, I think a pro, I, I feel like you asked two questions there. I did. I'm sorry. Different, might not be a con, but <laughs> I, I feel like pros and cons, um, mm -hmm. cons. I, I, if I were to redo it, I'm not sure I would have done it as fast as we did and as, um, out there as we did just for us personally, as a couple, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, like, I think we really underestimated how much work it was going to be to put that story out there. And, and that really just took a toll on our, our health and like our like ability. I mean, we traveled the country for 14 months and we did how many showings we did. It was just a lot to work and have a family and be a human and be married. And like, it was and just, move. yeah, we moved a whole bunch. Like it was just, it was a lot. So I feel like con was like, that was a, that was too fast, too hard for me personally. Um, pros, I feel like those automations that we set up are stellar and will change our entire future. More so, I feel like we've set our daughter up to have a life that I could have never even dreamed about for her. Um, one of my favorite takeaways from all of it is that our little, we have like a little pod of friends, especially during quarantine, right? We've had this little pod of kids and there's four of them because Jovi's an only child. So we needed other people to be friends with. Um, but one of the, my favorite things that they all say is whenever I say, here's a dollar, what do you do? And they all say, save half. And they like are regurgitating that at such a young age that I feel like that is, that's foundational in a change that, you know, Scott and I could have, you know, talked about all day long, but the fact that we did it and we saw the differences and to set her up financially in the future to allow her to have a life that. I, I feel like we could have never dreamed of that. And that is the absolute pro of all of it. I mean, for, forget about what we have bought or not bought. Like her future is completely different because of what we did. Yeah. Amazing. I totally agree. I would piggyback off of that a little bit and say, I totally agree with her hundred percent. That's like one of the biggest pros. And if I have to think of a different one, it would be, um, you know, the whole leading by example thing. Um, it's a good one. With, well, I think that's what you're describing is like yeah. we're leading by example and that has had outward effects in our own, our, friends, uh, our, our own family. family and our friends and those friends, kids and like the multi-generational effects of this is, has been really fun to watch. But by leading by example, um, we take that and we're, we're, we have examples that, that we're running from, like we're running through, right? Like, it's not like we made this stuff up. Uh -huh. We found this stuff through people that came before us who are far smarter than we are. And taking that, taking those, um, those perspectives, uh, and applying them to our life has been by far and away the biggest pro, like for instance, um, you know, uh, our, our newfound dedication to service, like the idea that we have to add service into our life, especially in the Phi uh, part of our journey, um, is, is going to be, I think, critical to our own personal happiness from a selfish standpoint, but also imagine the additional ripple effects that this type of thing can have. And so. You know, when, when we all grow up in, in so much, um, with so many advantages and, and, you know, I, I guess I look at it a little bit differently. A lot of people, you see a lot of shade thrown at like the fire movement and really just personal finance and money in general from people who say like, oh yeah, it must be nice. And you have all these advantages and privileges thrown around a lot and all this stuff. And it's like, I, I understand all that. And, and I, I mean, I, I don't, I can't understand all of that, but what I mean is, is I, I hear it and, and I'm, and I'm paying attention to it. But I also sort of had this inverse um, argument to it, which is 
I think the biggest shame would be is if we had all of these advantages and we didn't take advantage of them and then turn around and predicate some of those advantages to service. And so, um, you know, that's the other example that I want to lead by in the future. And I don't think I would have been able to do that had we been living paycheck to paycheck, succumb to some of the luxuries that really don't matter at the end of the day. Um, and so we can kind of hold our head up with a little bit more pride, not only for ourselves, but also multi-generationally, because that's how we're going to raise our, our child and how we want to see our, our families and our extended family and our extended friends, you know, friends do it. And so you um, have to, you that's have to give big... back all that knowledge that you learn. And I think that's such a big piece of something else that opened the door for us was now that we've started talking about money with all sorts of our friend groups, I mean, across the country, um, conversations that never would have come up are helpful and and like make you think about things a different way and that is that's amazing to unlock that you know instead of being fearful about it hey let's help each other if you're doing something over here that's helping you let's combine forces and be better together so we can help other people do that why is this a super secret thing like no it's not let's talk about it so i feel like that's been huge yeah, it's been interesting to kind of unpack people's money, people's relationship with money. And then when they trust us enough where they start to open up about it, we can really help with essentially like money therapy in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. even though we're not qualified, you know, <laughs> really. It depends um, on how many glasses of wine I've had. I yeah. can be very, very <laughs> yeah. qualified speaking, to help you. Speaking of pros and cons, <laughs> one of the cons hey. is... No, 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 not your, <laughs> not your drinking problem. My drinking, no. <laughs> yeah, That's always we, been a problem. We've unlocked all this time, and now we're just filling it with drinking. Um, <laughs> no shade thrown, no. The, uh, the, uh, the con, I would say, is like some, you know, I think we've gone, we've gone through uh, sort of, yeah, like, like just, uh, I'm trying to think of a, how, what's something we could go through that's painful. Um, it's like, like an a, American gladiator, it's like, just like a transition you know, of life. just getting slammed left and right from not only from like criticisms it's, of our project it's been or very like public. personal our, our stuff, journey has been very public, so. but also some of the stuff we've done in private, like where we were early on, like testing our, our money knowledge and like how much we wanted to talk about money with our friends and family, stuff like that. And that has, that's backfired at times. And like, we've mm -hmm. had to learn from that and get better about how we talk about money and all those things. So I, I guess maybe that's that's sort of a convoluted con because ultimately kind of it made us better. So it's kind yeah. of a pro, but yeah. I'd say a con is just like, yeah, like trying to do something good with your time and your skills. I would say that's what the impetus was for the doc and the book that we, that we made with playing with fire and like, and then just seeing some of the like negative comments, especially from within the fire movement, really, those are the ones that really sting because first of all, there's been so much amazing like conversation coming out of that and feedback and like yeah but he, anyone will tell you a, like you only focus on the a, negative of course if you, if you're you, such a leo but he's if such you, a leo you know, yeah 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 but if you believe in the positive comments and you have to believe in the negative and then you can you know you see the so negative hard on and, himself. it's tough whatever it's it's <laughs> we have, it we have a is. whole a we have con. a whole episode about that about how like the the negative you do seem, outweighs the yeah, we, we got I, we probably have 400 crazy. positive comments on this podcast and we got uh, one one star and we did a whole episode on the one yeah. star. <laughs> That's right. So it's what does that nice. say? What's what an example? Fight the power. I can't, I, I, I get some emails that are just uh, like ruthless sometimes and I'll, I'll read them to Tay and, and I'll be like all upset and like seething and she's like, don't even worry about it. And instead what I've been doing, because I didn't worry about it, I had so much coming in for a while there just like influx of all kinds of stuff that I couldn't handle it all of it anyway. So I really did just put it away. But now like it comes in at a totally acceptable pace, if at all, sometimes. And so sometimes it'll, it'll just hit your inbox and you're just like having a good day. Everything's fine. And then you just see this email and you're like, what the hell did you just say? <laughs> and so I just go right back at it. Just boxing gloves are ready. Let's go for it. Tell me how I could have done this better, man. Like all this stuff. And I got to say like 99% of the time when I fight back, I get the. I'm sorry. I oh, you know what? I'm really sorry about that. You know, I or oh, or oh funny. oh, sorry. Didn't didn't expect you to even answer this. Da, 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 da. It's like what? What are you spending your time on? 
Jeez. Like criticizing it's, uh, someone's it's internet. Like, uh, when you get you get your like internet yeah. gloves on, or you like feel like, oh, I'm really powerful because I'm behind this keyboard and keyboard uh, warriors. Yeah, right? keyboard warrior. There we go. Absolutely. Yeah. But you guys, there's like it's two like, burning it's like questions the though. There's, yeah. Right. There's, yeah. There's a lot of really wonderful stories of people that have had amazing things, and that's really. I feel like no, it is. <laughs> it's, that's where we should be focused. Like the amazing stories that people write in and say, like, you changed my life. It's Thank true. You. It's true. I also will read those to taste sometimes. And like we get beclemmed, we get like all shaken up because we're like, geez, yeah. this is just, I couldn't have ever imagined, you Gotta know, lean in on positively that. affecting people this way. This is awesome. Like it makes you feel good selfishly, but also like knowing what that's doing for people. It is so rewarding and so fantastic. It absolutely outweighs the stupid negative internet police, whatever. But, I think Taylor's um, got a good a point con. there, man. I think you should lean into that a little bit more. Be good for yeah. your, good for your mm -hmm. health. <laughs> yeah. But you're such a, I can see, I can see the artist in you. You want to look at the dark stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Nicole's yes. got some burning I questions. Do. I have two burning questions and I have to ask them before we run out of time. Um, so I guess the first one is how, Taylor, how close are you to being able to stop recruiting? That's a great question. Um, first of all, I, I love, absolutely love my job still to this day. My team has been so amazing through this last year of hardship. I think it's been a really interesting year for everybody. Um, but honestly, we're at a place right now that if we needed to be done, we could be done in a couple years, probably. Um, I think, I don't know that I'm going to ever be done. I have to be honest. I feel like that's the, the beauty. We, you can choose. Yes. I feel exactly. like we have become like very, um, uh, very particular about our time. And if I'm able to work in a specific time frame and have my daughter on both ends of that, I feel like it's the best of both worlds. I really do get to have a little outside, you know, brain stimulation. And then I also have time to be with my family. And so I think just having choice in that has like opened so many doors and being able to, you know, be in charge of that and say, Hey, I get to choose if I want to be done when I'm really done from a numbers perspective. But I mean, it was wildly faster than I thought. I have to be honest. Wow. I couldn't believe, like, when we really look at numbers, even last year during, you know, when everything kind of went dark and everyone was quiet, Scott was just constantly reminding me, like, you don't need to be worried. Like, it's really going to be fine. Even if, like, nothing comes back, it's going to be fine. And that, like, assurance is, it, for from a mental health perspective, is night and day from where I was, right? I literally had to give my child off my bosom to someone and be like I have to leave because I can't afford to like not leave you know yeah and to be able to say the opposite is I mean it's a huge weight off my shoulders that was the freedom we were looking for and we found it way earlier than we thought so ultimately like it did work we have succeeded in totally as far as what we were pursuing yeah so that, and yeah. that's Amazing. like when you guys were talking about like earlier about defining what fire is to you to me, that's what it is. It's not retiring early. It's just having a choice over like where you put your time. Like yeah. I, I'm with you, Taylor. Like I used to think like, oh, I want to stop working. And the second that I was like, I don't have to go to work. I all of a sudden was like, I wouldn't mind going to work. Like there's a mental thing yeah. that happens. I think where you can enjoy things more when it's not being forced on you and it's your sure. choice and you don't need it it's more yeah. of a want or it's a want something that would be yeah and as humans we need to be productive right i mean that's that's yeah. critical to our happiness yeah we want to we want to have some sort of sense of we're we're doing something making a difference we're Contribution. contributing yes. yeah absolutely yeah. so yeah. my other burning question is just going back to the initial analogy of um running a marathon what mile are you at <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're at 20. I think we're like. Well, well let's think about this metaphor oh, real deep. No. <laughs> You're at mile 20. Nicole. No, no acronyms or numbers, buddy. <laughs> I haven't run a marathon. I've run a I've lot heard, of marathons. I've heard mile 20 is like actually the worst, right? Because yeah. you, know, you still have four miles to go and you're just like. 6.2, no? buddy. 6.2. 6.2 is the worst? 26. Oh, it's the last point. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe 24 is the worst because you think that you're done. And then they're like, oh, no, you Scott, got 2.2, 2, bro. Scott. He would think you said four miles left at mile 20. So at mile 24, then you still Oh, is it 26? I see what you guys are laughing about. I see. See, you're talking to a non-runner here. Um, 
I think <laughs> I think we're at mile twenty. I feel like we can see the finish line. We know where we're at. Um, from a marathon runner. Can himself. you see four or six miles away? <laughs> <laughs> now you're getting sure. literal. Sure. I feel like you know where you're at. You know where you're at. You're comfortable in your zone. You're not trying to find, at least for me, when I've run marathons, I feel like for me, mile 20, it can be hard depending on the circumstances. But I feel like we're in a really good spot. We're, we're in a routine. There's there's not a whole ton of new surprises at that point. And, um, and we don't have a lot of wants. Yeah. I feel like we're very clear on our happiness and like what we're like from a social perspective, you know, I think that was like also one of the biggest realizations was you feel so like, oh my gosh, I'm going to move into a house nobody likes, or I'm going to drive a car no one likes. And then you do it and you realize that your real friends don't care at all <laughs> about any of that. And so I feel like we're very comfortable with saying, no, we, we're not going to do that. We don't want to spend the money or no, we're going to live in this house that nobody wants to live in because it makes sense for us financially. And guess what? Nobody cares. And I feel like we're very comfortable in our fire skin. And we're, um, I think we see like a very clear plan. And I don't know, you know, that we have all the answers for everything, but I, I think we've got a good foundation for what's to come. Yeah. Amazing. I love it. I love it. Well, I think that's, I think that's my overall takeaway, uh, I would say, is that um, there's no one way to fire and you guys are defining that in your own way i think you and i have been defining that in our own way over the Mm. past few years and you know i've definitely had the intensity path uh, that i've freaked out my wife a few (laughs) times uh, multiple times call call me anytime nicole i know i'm going to (laughs) (laughs) you're my spirit animal (laughs) like that movie i was like Yes, thank you for being the voice of reason <laughs> of <laughs> everything I would want to, yeah. to have said. <laughs> but isn't that what marriage is all about, it darling? It somebody is. who's way too intense and then somebody who holds you, you know, and did like, hey, dude, calm down. Let's enjoy today a little no, bit too. I, right. I heard that marriage marriage <laughs> yeah. is always needing to be in the same drawer in the kitchen at the same time. That oh, my God. definition of marriage. It's like you never needed to be in that drawer and then like all of a sudden now you need to be. Why? Get out of here. You're never in this drawer. It's so annoying. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, let's uh let's uh let's wrap it up. I have one question uh from from the audience. Uh it's from Jacob and he wants to know if you guys currently share one car at this point or do you have your own cars? We do. Oh, good question, Jacob. Yes, we pride ourselves on having one vehicle. Yeah. Um We lean in hard on that one. Yeah, that <laughs> one's big. Uh and I will is this say, more from a fire a perspective or, or from a, you guys are in Bend and it's beautiful? Or are you trying to protect the environment? Where, where are we with this? Oh, yeah. All those all things. The above. Yeah. We, from an environmental standpoint, we're trying to be conscious. We have a five and a half year old who's asking us, like, you know, why things are getting hotter and things like that. So, yeah. you know, knowing that that's on her mind and it's something we want to, again, lead by example, it's important for us. And so, yeah, we say it with pride to people who ask and we always try to you know, do like the subtle nudge of, yeah, you know, you really should think about it yourself because you live in Bend and it's, you know, 15 minutes everywhere and we, we get by and they're like, you get by. Yeah, we've been doing it for four we years. We have bicycles, we walk. I Everyone laughs at me and says I need to have a walking channel because I'm like the person on the side of the street that everyone always sees walking. Like I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> like I love to walk everywhere. Also, we, walk we made a little bit of a sacrifice as far as like our um, – I shouldn't say sacrifice. We we decided very diligently on our location so we could be around things that we could walk to. School, grocery store, you know, daily use. What she's saying is things. we spent a little bit more to be able to walk more. And that was far that far exceeded the worth for us as opposed to like uh, spending a little bit less on the house, but then having to have two cars have to two be able cars. to get places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we went that route. And so we feel very fortunate to be able to have done that. But um, the other thing that I say is a total hack, and Andy, you know this, because we've been back and forth on this a million times on the internet, is uh, I, we have electric bikes. And I can't stress that enough. I mean, they are just, they are a legitimate second vehicle. And for us, we live in a climate where we have all four seasons, including uh, snow. And I use my bike year round. It's very rare that I can't get my bike out there. I think I missed four days of not riding or biking, even in snow last year. Or walking, you should have walking. What I say? Riding or biking. Oh, I only ride in the fun wagon. That's what I call it, which is supposed to be for my child when I don't want to ride my bike. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I like to walk and ride, but snowshoe too. Like, yeah. you can, there's lots of different options. A lot of ways to mobility. And anyway, 
What, what I love about that, though, is like, you know, we're always trying to carve out time in the day to, I need to get in my workout. I need to do 20 yeah. minutes here. I need to do 30 minutes there. But if your lifestyle is active, you don't need to carve out the time to get to the gym or because you're doing it all day long, right? I haven't been to the gym and I am at uh, 10,300 steps today. Amazing. So, wow. There you go. You Good know, job. and it's only 350 here. So I have a whole rest of the afternoon to go. You have plenty yet, of huh? bottles of wine to drink for, for the rest of the <laughs> I day. Do. I'm so excited. <laughs> We should walk to the store and get some more wine. There you go. Now you're talking. Now you're talking. Well, I know we've taken up almost an hour of your evening or your early evening for that matter. We just want to thank you guys so much for being here. It's been a pleasure catching up. And for anybody who's interested in learning more about this movie, watching it, purchasing it, supporting you guys and supporting the movement in general, where should they go? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, they can find all of this on playingwithfire.co, and I highly recommend they uh, sign up to the email newsletter because that is active when we do things and not active when we don't. We do not spam it. We don't We don't uh, spray and pray. It's mm-hmm. just every once in a while we give the updates, and uh, we've got some really, really cool things coming down the pipe here shortly with uh, a very cool uh, cohort-based course that we're building with a, a fellow friend. His name's Rob. Uh, Robert Shea, and he's a certified financial planner. And so we're, 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 we're just, we're building this thing right now. And it's going to be a live interactive six week long, um, life-changing experience. And it's been so fun to build so far. So yeah, go check it out. And follow me on Twitter. I love Twitter. And it's not to be confused with the John Cena movie. Oof. I think that, right? that, that, that hits, Correct. that hits the stomach. Yeah. Doesn't it there, buddy? Like, don't look Come this hard. up on just Amazon Prime you can movies look it up or on whatever. Amazon, but it's can you? Play, you can look it up on Amazon, but it's playing with fire. The documentary. The right. documentary. You just okay. have to add documentary okay. to it. You'll find yeah. it right away. Yeah. John got it. Cena. He bless his soul. He didn't mean to do this, but oh. his movie got. Uh, first of all, it got announced after we had announced ours, and then they Ugh. moved up the uh, the date that they released to be a week before ours. When it was supposed to be months after, <laughs> and we had our little corner of the world with playing with fire, and then all of a sudden it was just all lost you know, to Johnson. a guy who didn't need the oh, money. Honey. <laughs> it's gonna be fine. Be fine. So, but I, you know, I got nothing but love for Mike and Kegel Key or Mike Michael Keegan Key. And oh, he's great, John Cena. Yeah, awesome. yeah. But I still haven't seen that movie, and I probably never will. Yeah, I, I yeah. would. I would assume that you'd probably never see that movie, and that is an okay thing because this is the movie you guys need to see: "Playing with Fire," the documentary. Go to playingwithfire.co. You guys check out this movie. If if you've heard about fire and you're just interested in it, this is your opportunity to play with fire. You can take a look at it, see how people are utilizing it to create space for their life, create freedom, create options, and then again. Don't get literal with it. You know, design it how you want to design it because that's the excitement with fire. And the fact there's some controversy around it kind of makes it a little fun. So go to the website, check out the movie. This could be a really fun movie for you to watch here on Friday night with uh, with your spouse and uh, and see see the, the the fun and the agony at times of our friend uh, Taylor. You can see which one you are. Are you a Taylor or are you a Scott? You know? That's right. See where you fall. Hashtag Team Taylor, hashtag Team Scott. Absolutely. Well, oh, thank you both so much. This has here. been a lot of fun. I'm so glad you guys were able to join us for a glass of wine. And we'll hope or for two. Hopefully, we'll guys see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. So nice talking with you. All right, I think we're still in the room. I just ended it. So no, I think it still says we're live, babe. Um, (laughs) no, it's yep. Never mind. Hey, we're still live. Whoops. (laughs)